Um, we're extremely lucky to have two of our strategic advisory board members here in person. Um, for the people who don't know them, we were in the presence of two NIH directors here, one Nobel laureate. Um, one former, one present. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one former, one present, yeah. So let me just introduce these um, gentlemen. So uh, Harold Varmus um, uh, was a, a doctor and is a researcher um, uh, working in cancer. He won the Nobel Prize for his work on uh, cancer-causing viruses um, and uh, became director of NCI, the National Institute, uh, National, oh, cancer. The National Cancer <laughs> Institute, uh, and was a director of NIH. Francis Collins is a geneticist who spearheaded uh, much of the early positional cloning work in the 1980s and then took on the role of uh, championing the Human Genome Project uh, over the 90s and 2000s. That's when I first met Francis. Um, and he uh, is the NIH director now, and I believe is really the only NIH director to serve under two presidents. Is that the right, uh, right phrase? First ah. to be appointed by two presidents. Yes. I have, okay, the only one to be appointed by two presidents, absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, these are, these are um, uh, wise men, and I'm gonna pepper them with uh, questions uh, over the next uh, period of time. So I just wanna start off, you, you're both known for your um, commitment to open science uh, in different ways, uh, Francis with the genome projects and Harold with your commitment to open publications. But I wondered if you always had had that mindset. Was there a moment when you uh, went from uh, to being a believer in open science? What made you believe in open science being so powerful? So Harold, maybe. Well, it's an interesting question because, um, well, as Ewan points out, uh, I've come to be known for advocating openness to the publication process, that is getting, building large public digital databases like PubMed, especially PubMed Central, and um, bringing in open access, and more recently for helping with the greater use of preprints, like the preprint that you just posted in BioArchive. Um, and uh, while I'm known for that, that recognition that the internet could change fundamentally the way scientists communicate uh, something that did come to me in one very um, narrowly defined moment when I was sitting in a bakery shop in San Francisco called Tassahara Bakery with my friend Pat Brown, and he told me about a discussion he had had with his lab group about Paul Ginsberg's creation of Archive, the, the repository for physics and, and computer science and, and, uh, uh, and astrophysics uh, preprints in 1991. Um, our meeting was eight years later, and I really, it, it, until I heard from Pat about that, I hadn't recognized how open things could be. And one of the things I find surprising about the whole story is one I had not really appreciated, and I'm not sure we all yet fully appreciate the power of the internet to make us all connected to everybody else. The second thing is that if I look back at my career, it's studded with uh, examples of, of uh, belief in sharing. Um, when I was uh, working on tumor viruses in the 1970s, my colleague Mike Bishop and I teamed up with people uh, at the uh, University of Southern California at Berkeley and other institutions on the, on the West Coast to create the uh, West Coast Tumor Virus Cooperative in which um, investigators up and down the coast got together on a fairly regular basis to share unpublished information. It really made the field go faster. Uh, uh, the, the viral replication cycle and the nature of retroviral oncogenes and their progenitors all came to uh, fruition much more quickly as a result. I spent part of the 1990s being sure that people shared their transgenic mice. But, in the, so I think the point here is that applying the principles that you may believe in in new ways, as we're trying to do with the Global Alliance, is, does require more than the fundamental mindset that sharing is a good thing, which I've always believed. It, was, it involves recognizing that those principles can now be applied in new spheres. Francis, was there a moment? 
I think it came more gradually, and sort of like Harold is saying, and maybe starting out with my own research efforts back in the 1980s, uh, chasing after the cystic fibrosis gene, which was a pretty tough job at that point because there was no genome project. There was no way that you could find your way through the thicket of complicated DNA sequence on chromosome 7 because you didn't have it in front of you. You had to find it. And it was, I'm thinking, it's actually exactly 30 years ago at the American Society for Human Genetics meeting, 1987, where it became clear to me that we were just not going to make progress if every group that was working on this decided they had to hold everything close and, and didn't share. And so we sat down at that same meeting with Lab Chi Choi's group working on the same issue of trying to find the cystic fibrosis gene from his lab at uh, Sick Kids in Toronto and decided we were going to merge our groups together and tackle this in, in a systematic way. And then began our own version of data sharing, which, believe it or not, was mostly by faxes. God help us if we had to do that now. <laughs> that's not what you call big data. That's like awful data. But it ultimately did result in a success another couple years later of finding the answer. So that was a sort of personal example of seeing how critical it is not to hold everything so close. Then, certainly in this experience that I was asked to do of leading the genome effort from the U.S., it became increasingly clear that if we were going to have this enterprise benefit, not just the people who were involved in the project, those 20 labs in six countries, but everybody, uh, there had to be a systematic way of sharing the data. And I think one can point to that meeting in Bermuda in 1996 as absolutely a seminal moment where the leaders of that effort, and I give particular credit here uh, to Bob Waterston and John Solston, who kind of led that particular part of the conversation, agreed that we would start giving the data away, putting it up on the internet every 24 hours as soon as an assembly of a kilobase or more was put forward, not waiting for any kind of other presentation or publication, but simply putting it out there. The Bermuda Rules, as they became to be known, then really transformed the ethics of how you do genome research and are resonating here in this very room today because of the way that got started at that point and then further got um, put into place for other kinds of genomic data in the Fort Lauderdale meeting, uh, which was also a rather contentious but interesting moment. And just another word of credit to Jeff Duick, who led that effort and got us in a very good place about saying this is not just about sequence coming from the Human Genome Project. It ought to be about other large-scale community projects as well, because why do you do the project if you're going to keep the data out of the hands of the people who are going to use it? So that's uh, very eloquent. But it's interesting that in geo for gh and in this future world, we have a, a clear commitment to this kind of respecting the privacy and the controlled access of the data. And, you know, some people see a tension here between those very open genome-wide foundational data sets and then this more controlled access style approach. And what are your thoughts about this? Are we, is this a retrograde step or is it a necessary step or um, uh, are we compromising or, or do we just roll on and, and make this work? Well, I think you have a job to do. That is to convince people that, that the only um, principle in the world is not privacy. That, yes, privacy is important, an important condition to worry about, but <clears throat> as Bartha made it clear in her tweet, um, that the right to medical progress and to reaping the benefits of science are an essential human right, and that uh, um, if we don't pool our data, we're not going to make those discoveries that everybody is entitled to. And I think there's a very strong balance between um, the, the privacy issue and the right to discover and to learn things that benefit everybody. Francis, what do you think? Well, this is the nexus of where we are going, because clearly the benefits for research are greatest if access is as wide open as it possibly can be. But there's one potential existential threat uh, to this wonderful, exciting phase uh, of genomic medicine and genomic health that we're all in, and that is to have a major episode where individuals had their still identifiable data fall into the hands of people that they had not given permission for. And you can't overstate the risks that res might result in such an outcome. Um, I'm engaged, as you might guess, in the All of Us program and trying to figure out how in the U.S. with this million-strong effort 
we can achieve the best outcome here, which is to get consent in a very explicit way from the participants who are at the table helping make these decisions about how to have that data accessible to anybody who's a qualified researcher. But it isn't available to every high school student who's trying to sort of figure out whether their next door neighbor is in the study and whether there's something in their medical record that might be fun to know about. We, we have to be honest about the fact that there have to be these kinds of serious thoughtful limits to accessibility if we're going to honor the dedication of people who are giving us their trust uh, by making their data available. That's true in research. When it comes to clinical practice, it will be true as well. So we have to get the balance right. I think we also have to pay attention to the way in which we protect um, people from abuse of, of data that may be obtained. We're, there are always going to be lapses in the system. Someone's going to figure out something. something someone's going to hack. And the, you know, the, the passage of GINA, which we both had a role in getting through Congress by working with members of Congress, very, very important to protect as much as we can. And that act actually could be still stronger, um, is a very important feature of all this, creating some kinds of penalties for people yep. who abuse the use of data that's obtained in strange ways. And as my friend Barbara Wald is in the audience is fond of pointing out to me, there ought to be ways to protect people from abuse, not just of data that's in the system, but of DNA that you leave behind when you wipe your mouth <laughs> after a meal. Um, because uh, there's ver very various kinds of, of, uh, of abuse of information that can be obtained through genomics, even if a genomicist didn't generate the data, uh, is, is something worth thinking about. Absolutely. Now, this conversation can often feel very um, US, perhaps Anglo. Um, uh, it's a valid criticism that we heard yesterday, but I know that both of you actually have worked away from the US, uh, away from English-speaking countries. And so maybe I can ask you both just to recount those experiences, but then also how important is it that we, we have an international context to this? Could we do, these, do this as separate countries? Could we just be inward looking? So if you could both speak to that. So I had the privilege of serving as a volunteer physician in Nigeria on a couple of tours, uh, spending a couple of weeks uh, working in a Mission Hospital in the Delta area, which had rather limited capabilities as far as laboratory, but were staffed by wonderfully visionary people. And it certainly taught me, this was now 20 years ago, that the opportunities for research in that setting, particularly if we could figure out how to do this in an international way, were profound. And of course, as a geneticist, I recognize, as we all must, that we are all basically black Africans who migrated out of Africa at some point or another and changed our phenotypes under the forces of evolution to some extent, but we are still all talking about the cradle of humanity. And if you really want to understand about humanity, Africa is probably the place where you should be working the hardest. I was delighted that Nikki Mulder uh, was up here a little earlier and talked about H3 Africa as a big step forward in that regard. Now 27 countries, more than 500 investigators, really trying to take what we've learned and what technologies we have and apply it in this very exciting way. And we need to do more of that. But the idea that we would do that in a constrained way with each country running their own enterprise would really deprive the people who are participating in that, both as researchers and as, uh, as the people donating the DNA, from what the ultimate consequences ought to be. So hard to imagine how you could defend that. I recognize, and this was pointed out earlier this morning, that there is a big challenge here, and again, we keep pointing to Bartha to solve all of this, in, in terms of what the ethical and particularly the legal constraints are about data sharing. And as much as one can look at those and say, boy, that's really getting in the way of progress and not serving a lot of purpose for anybody, there are still strong opinions in, in uh, legislative realms uh, that are trying to keep things from getting outside of their control. And there's going to take a lot of work uh, to try to turn some of those around. Well, as, uh, as I mentioned to you last night, you and um, when I was in medical school, I had a phase when I wanted to be what we then called a tropical disease investigator worker. And I spent several months in northern India working at a, at a, um, at a, hosp at a mission hospital, um, uncharacteristically. Um, I'm not a missionary. but. Um, Far from it, but but uh, it did Im, um, solidify my conviction that that medicine is an international process. And You're a missionary for science. Harold. A missionary that's for science. <laughs> that's, that's right. Right. Uh, not for higher beings, um, but but for all of us. But in any event, uh, um, 
uh, over, the, over the ensuing years, uh, whenever opportunities to, to do work that would advance the sense that, that uh, science and medicine are international endeavors, I've tried to grasp that uh, through whether it's publication practices to get information everywhere. Uh, I was involved in, in developing a pan-African movement called uh, the, multi the Multinational um, uh, Initiative in Malaria um, that uh, resulted in a meeting that occurred 20 years ago in Senegal. Uh, and uh, recently, as director of the NCI, uh, I built a center for global health that uh, uh, tried to make clear that, that something that is actually been written about in the newspaper just a couple of weeks ago that there's a lot that can be done to prevent and treat cancer even in the poorest countries. And sometimes we forget that uh, we have many tools that are cheaper than whole exome sequencing for, for, for trying to control cancer rates, including vaccines and, and uh, smoking campaign, anti-smoking campaigns and so forth. One of the things that is, of course, critical that you learn in developing countries is how prevalent uh, infectious diseases still are and how borders between countries are not, not necessarily uh, prohibitions to the transport of those diseases. And the quick diagnosis of, of either somebody who ha simply has a new infection or quick diagnosis of somebody who's carrying the beginning, the seeds of an epidemic is really critical. And that's a place where genomics has a major role. I know that so far the GA4GH has not gotten deeply invested in that area, but uh, as I said on the, on the first day back in January 28, uh, 2013, I do think that in the future of this organization, uh, more attention ought to be given to uh, the use of genomics. Uh, I know there are political issues here, but, uh, but, but it is an important thing. And in my own role at the New York Genome Center in New York, uh, I've been arguing, still unsuccessfully, but uh, nevertheless continue to argue that uh, the one way for genomics to become part of the, the the, the medical landscape in New York and the Genome Center to be part of that is to say we are there 24-7 to help diagnose uh, someone who comes in uh, and arrives at Kennedy with a temperature of 104. Francis, you wanted to... While well, we're talking that. about low and middle income countries, I wanted to make another sort of plea uh, that we think hard about changing the relationship uh, between the rich countries and the poor countries when it comes to research. And some of us have been working hard recently on this, particularly with it comes to sub-Saharan Africa. Because the model right now is most of the time research gets done in those countries because you know, there's a donor, and sometimes it's NIH, that decides that there's a project they want to see done. But it isn't necessarily what the country themselves would choose as the ideal model for what they want to get done. And so projects get funded and dollars flow and then they disappear. And there's no opportunity to build infrastructure for research in country. We need to change that. We need to, as Jeremy Farrar has said, change the center of gravity, move it from the colonial model, which is kind of what a lot of research currently looks like, uh, to one where you go from donorship to ownership, where the countries, are, where the research is being done actually own it. That's a big challenge uh, if we're talking about Sub-Saharan Africa. The Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, uh, NIH, and the Alliance for Excellent Science in Africa, AESA, which is in Nairobi, have now ganged together to try to put this in action uh, called now CARI, the Coalition for African Research and Innovation. The goal being that if you look forward a decade, that infrastructure will have been built, research capacity will have been built, the brain drain will have been reversed because African scientists who want to do great science won't feel they have to go elsewhere to do so. H3 Africa is a great pilot to show how this can happen. MEPI, the Medical Education Partnership Initiative, which is part of uh, NIH and PEPFARS Alliance, is also making progress in that <coughs> regard. But for GA4, GH, you want to be international, and I totally agree with that, and you particularly want to be sure that you have connections in countries that maybe have not had the greatest resources. This is something to sort of align yourself with and work closely with. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that both of you there touched on developing countries, which are obviously important. Just, you know, my perspective from being a, in a European institution, there's also something very, very powerful about the diversity in Europe. So if you just even take the way ethics of this data sharing is thought out about, between Denmark and Germany, which share a common border and actually have quite a complicated arrangement in that common space. And yet the way they think about data sharing for 
medical research is very, very different. And so I think also it's incredibly important that we use this diversity of approaches to help sort of understand and make robust our, our system. So I think uh, there is um, uh, something important about embracing the diversity of cultural aspects, including well-resourced countries that very often start from a different place in how they think about uh, data sharing. And I don't know if you've got, I, I have experiences of this, and I don't know if you've met some of these experiences. Well, I experiences. think one, one of the important things to recognize once you get into the question of uh, how you're going to do science in a global fashion is the incredible variety of uh, problems res with respect to governance, finance, um, how resources are being allocated in the, in, the, in the country. If you want to make science owned by that country, it's not always so easy because of issues that really don't have to do directly with the science, they have to do with how science is funded, how the, what, what, the, what the national stability is like. I'll give you one example from my own experience. Uh, in the malaria world, one of the most important sites for doing malaria research, a place that was nurtured initially by by the NIH, but now is working independently. Uh, the the um, um, the center for the, the the center for malaria research and training in Bamako, Mali, is not a place you can work easily today because of terrorism and uh, insta political instability in Mali. It's not that they don't want to do the work. Um, uh, one of the things that was most effective when we first went to help them was to to build the the internet uh, the internet connections. Those, um, even there are places in Africa now where it's still not nearly as stable as it ought to be. So looking at conditions on the ground is obviously incredibly important and, you know, obviously cultural differences in Europe are important as well, but, but uh, sometimes these are even more profound when you compare the Congo with Rwanda, which is right next door. Francis, do you have any thoughts? So, um, yeah, I, I think we could certainly start by doing a better job uh, in circumstances where it ought to be easier, uh, you, where countries have a common border, or even, you know, four countries, uh, let's say U.S., Canada, uh, U.K., and Australia, separated by a common language uh, that could actually have an opportunity uh, to do this in a more seamless way than we currently do. Let's, let's not say that it's all about those other folks. It's about a lot of people in this room as well. And the influence that we might have in terms of trying to harmonize uh, data sharing understanding. A very critical component to all of this, and I know you're working hard to try to get um, representation at GA4GH, is China. China is going to be an enormous producer of genomic data. And uh, the exact means by which that is going to be shared, I don't think has really quite been worked out. And this would be a really good moment for GA4GH uh, to be at the table as that kind of conversation is happening. Uh, it's, it's on our to-do list, uh, Peter and mine, for sure. Let's, let's switch topics now to the, a different kind of orthogonal axis, <coughs> which is the, the researcher to clinical researcher to clinical practitioner. And, you know, sometimes it does feel a bit like oil and uh, water, oil and vinegar. You know, you, sh you put a lot of energy in to shake it all up and get some kind of uh, uh, interface going. You let it go and it all separates out again and, and one starts to, to see kind of tribal boundaries here uh, being built up. So you've both lived this world. Is there some kind of trick to making uh, basic research and, and uh, clinical research and clinical practice all get along together? Is there some way of, uh, uh, of, um, of keeping this in, a, in an emulsified state? Well, in the, in the in area of oncology, things um, have progressed quite a lot since my early days. I remember I mean, both Francis and I are trained as MDs. We know the language. We know how to take care of patients, or we did. Uh, and uh, I remember in the, in the early days of my life as an, as an investigator at University of California, San Francisco, um, I remember going into the men's room with a cl clinician with whom I was friendly, and we just had nothing to say as we stood at parallel urinals because, uh, you know, we just didn't speak the same language anymore. That's changed dramatically. The goal, the, one of the new goals that you've laid, that you've laid out, uh, well, clinicians have begun to understand that, that uh, the targeted therapies work, the diagnostic categories are being changed by by genetic analysis of cancers. Um, but in thinking about how we get the message, the new message of the GA4GH, 
to clinicians, first of all, you've got to remember that, that clinicians are not antagonistic towards science. They're just baffled, they're overworked, it's very it's difficult, and one of the big problems that we're going to face as a community trying to make uh, the discipline of genomics relevant to medicine everywhere, which it should be, is how we educate folks who come from a very different set of, of uh, conditions. Some people went to medical school 40 years ago. They didn't, they didn't never learn anything about uh, molecular medicine, and it's going to be a challenge to get them to learn how to interpret the kinds of data they're receiving. I think that's going to change over the, over the years. I enjoyed last night your analogy with how radiology became an accepted part of medicine. There was a time when this was all mysterious, and um, it did take many, many years, development of new technologies, uh, the building of departments of radiology that, uh, that helped to educate uh, the docs in the trenches. And I think similar things are going to have to happen here, and we can talk all we want about how important it is to incorporate genomics into the, into the practice of oncology or infectious disease or anything else, um, but there's going to be an educational process that I hope the Global Alliance will help to take on because what you're doing in, in efforts to, uh, not, maybe not doing the tutorials, but learning standards, how to teach, ma making, making materials that are helpful to those who will be able to go and, 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 and take these biblical messages to, uh, to, the, to the abandoned troops. But um, you know, there's no doubt that uh, it doesn't take very long for, um, a, for someone taking care of a, of a patient with cancer to learn that they might be able to help that patient in a dramatic way, not just by making a correct diagnosis, but deciding whether or not immunotherapy is appropriate or whether, or whether um, a targeted therapy should be uh, uh, proposed or whether the prognosis is influenced by some feature of, of the genetic information or whether there's a propensity to cancers of a certain type within a family, as Peter alluded to a moment ago. Uh, these are all very important features of, of sophisticated practice of medicine and uh, there will be problems in getting there. The one other thing I'll say before I shut up about this is that, that uh, one critical issue that I've been thinking about and writing about recently is how we get the insurance industry on board with this stuff too. Coverage of the kinds of tests that will be necessary to take care of cancer patients appropriately is going to require that both government and private funders of, of the cost of medical care, which are significant, to be uh, willing to reimburse for these tests if they're, if they're done in appropriate ways. So oversight of the testing, recognition that even if we did whole exome sequencing on every cancer patient would still be one or two percent of the total cancer, uh, cost of cancer care in, in the U.S. Um, it's, it's relatively small, and building the kind of continuous learning systems that you alluded to and have been um, part of our conception of pr precision medicine ever since the IOM report in 2011 will be critical for working all this out. So people will see that what they do in clinical practice when they generate new genomic data if it's put into the right kind of database where it can be worked on and um, communicated, and probably it's going to be very important to have the, the primary data that we like to look at translated into fairly simple language because these guys are, and gals, are simply overworked and it's going to be very hard for them to respond to all the pressures that are on them to, 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 see, to see patients and do rigorous medicine at the same time that they're filling out all their forms and, and all the other things that they have to do. So Francis, do you have a magic way of blending research and clinician? Um, it's a bunch of things that are all going to be necessary at the same time, and Harold has hit on most of them. Uh, certainly to have particular areas of medicine where this is already becoming fundamental to delivering good care, oncology is the prime example, uh, is going to motivate physicians to actually learn about this. because. Docs get beaten up all the time uh, for being, you know, insufficiently attentive to new evidence, but they want to take care of patients in the best way. They want to help people, and if you can prove to them that this new kind of intervention is going to get there, they will begin to get really interested, and oncologists are in that space. Developmental pediatricians are in that space as well because of the way in which genome sequencing is revealing a lot of answers to mysteries that they and their patients used to be terribly frustrated about. 
Another thing that we, uh, it's a small effort on the scale of the world, but it might be worth looking as a pilot. In this all of us effort, admittedly, I'm talking America here again, uh, enrolling these million participants, the way in which many of them are going to be enrolled is through health provider organizations. That means that the docs that are taking care of them will have access to this data and that as revelations come up about better means for prevention and treatment, that will immediately be apparent uh, to the docs in those HPOs, and therefore you should shorten the time dramatically from when you know a result to when it can be implemented. If we could see how that transfer occurs and then figure out how to export it more broadly, that's one of the things I hope we'll get out of all of us is learning how to do that transition. But I think Harold is right that ultimately what may drive this, uh, sorry to say, is probably money that if there is reimbursement available, then people are going to be much more likely to embrace uh, genomic approaches. Right now, that's a big problem. So um, again, if you want to herd a lot of cats, in this case, uh, the physicians around the world that are being asked to take care of this, it's hard to do that, but you can move their food, and the food in this case <laughs> is likely to be reimbursement for these efforts, which then makes it a lot more attractive. You do have to come up with decision support tools to make it possible for people who have not had an extensive deep knowledge of genomics to know how to make the right recommendations because there's some risk here that this will actually go the wrong way in some circumstances because people, physicians, won't know what to do with the data. But that's another part of our responsibility. Just quick highlight for the organization called G2MC, uh, Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative or something like that, uh, which is uh, Jeff Ginsburg and Terry Manolio trying to focus very much worldwide on this effort of how do we transition this kind of genomic skill uh, into the healthcare system. Well, I'm really excited uh, later on this afternoon that we have Sue Hill from NHS England talking about the NHS's approach of really a population-wide rollout of what Genomics England has shown um, works very well, which is the very straightforward business of sequencing genomes of rare diseased uh, patients, and as Kim showed. Interestingly enough, do you, does that make you feel kind of proud of the human genome? Do you feel there's a moment now where you can chalk a win up? There are many wins, but is this a better win than the previous ones at all? Or uh, do you have a scorecard somewhere in the back of your uh, uh, office? Um, no, I don't. But if I did, it would have about 22 columns on it saying we finished the human genome sequence and we just keep checking and checking and checking and <laughs> eventually it might even be true. Uh, <laughs> 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 but, but no, Genomics I mean, in joke, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you know, I, 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 a few little, little, little uh, uh, couple of crannies. Couple there. of there centuries. Are and crannies. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, can yeah. keep putting down new boxes and checking those too. <laughs> but no, I'm a physician. I got. You, know, you can always remind us that it's not quite done yet. <laughs> <laughs> I got interested in all of this because of the expectation that it was going to have a big impact on medicine and the health of the world, and to begin to see that playing out in very significant ways. I'm impatient. I wish it was happening faster, but you can certainly point to where we are now compared to, you know, 2000 when I was hounding you about finishing up that data analysis. Would you please? You and you and had a big meltdown, I think, in the fall of 2000 when I was pushing a little too hard. But I, I did it snap. made a difference. <laughs> But I think it is fair to remember that, uh, that the expectations for delivery of, of a new kind of health care based on, on having the human genome were not our creations. I, mean, I, I, I was there when, when Francis was leading the Genome Project. And, you know, we, when we had announcements, it was frequently announcing that we had discovered a gene useful in treatment of breast cancer or possibly a clue to, to Parkinson's disease. Um, and I don't think there was the level of overpromising that, that, that people assert. I think the audience said, aha, they've got this, you know, that, this whole genome thing worked out and we're going to have medicines for everything in the next few years. And, you know, dealing with, with the completely understandable impatience of people who have disease now is one of the most difficult things we face generically in medical research. You know, I, I'm excited when we discover a new gene and we find that, uh, you know, that mutant splicing factors are playing a role in a variety of cancers, but then people say, well, you know, when, when is the drug going to be available for treating those cancers? And, I, and I, it's the realistic answer is we don't know if we'll ever have them, and if we will, it, it'll be five to ten years. It's hard to deal with that, and as 
genomics becomes a more integral part of medicine and people, people's yeah. expectations will go up in a way that I think you should pay attention to trying to control. Uh, it's an interesting problem and it's something that I, I also feel the challenge in these things about, about describing what could happen if we all work together and we put our effort in uh, and yet not saying, and tomorrow, you know, we're going to solve this uh, either for a healthcare system mm -hmm. or, or for something else. It, it is an endless challenge, that. Uh, we have another community in this um, organization, and that's the community of, of engineers, of data scientists, people coming from often commercial um, companies um, and also a completely different academic discipline of, of, of computer science. Um, uh, high-end statistics, uh, electrical engineering sometimes. And uh, what would you say to these, um, these entries to them? Are you welcome? Um, uh, uh, please, please fix well, things. You've got to beg them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, is there, uh, again, this kind of crossing disciplines and bringing another group of people in? Are there, is there anything you could... Um, suggest that we don't do about how we integrate um, uh, a different set of uh, scientists and skills uh, into us? Well, it's a great opportunity and it's great fun to be part of one of those moments where expertise of different skill sets comes together and realizes that they have something they can do that neither could have done by themselves. I mean, the Genome Project was very much like that with the combination of biology and robotics and computer science uh, and um, a lot of automation. And that's one of the reasons it was so exciting to be part of, and that's getting recreated all the time. Uh, my concern is we still have a, a very serious shortage, uh, particularly of data scientists that have migrated into biology, and we need to do everything possible to lure some of those bright minds that otherwise are going to Silicon Valley and you know developing the next app for your phone that might be kind of fun, but it isn't actually providing the kind of benefit to humanity. That's what we can offer. We can offer for people who not just want to have fun and make some money, but who want to have a real ch an impact on the world's health. Hey, come on down. Have we got opportunities for you? And that's in genomics, but that's in other kinds of life science as well. Neuroscience, for instance, desperately needs more of that kind of skill. So we should be doing everything we can uh, to build those bridges, to create training opportunities. What we must not do is expect people who are pure computer scientists to walk into a life science situation without the opportunity to learn the biology and then think it's going to go well. You have to be sure that that is part of whatever kind of training enterprise we put together. The people who don't have that experience end up chasing after questions that don't really matter that much, as opposed to focusing on the real central issues that we all got to work on together. But if there was ever a time to try to solve those problems, particularly for data science and engineering, it's right now. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. Uh, one thing that we uh, I want to add to that is uh, something that is, will not be apparent to people outside the U.S. and maybe not even to people inside the U.S., which is that many of the strengths that we are enjoying um, in the world of, of computer science and, and engineering in the U.S. is the result of funding not by the NIH, but by but funding of other, other uh, agencies, especially the Department of Energy. And while uh, we're living through a bit of a crisis in the U.S. at the moment, uh, a lack of support from the administration for science, lack of recognition that science exists, a lack of respect for evidence. Um, and while the NIH has its strong defenders and advocacy communities and members of Congress, some other departments that fund very important science, important to us, including the Department of Energy, are not getting either the leadership that is required in those agencies or the funding. Um, at the end of the last administration, I was working uh, with the Department of Energy on a plan to try to increase the level of collaboration between NIH and DOE, a, 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 a proposal strongly endorsed by both Francis and by Ernie Muniz, who was then the, the Secretary of Energy. Um, at the moment, um, it, the, the budget cuts and the lack of leadership in the Department of Energy is a very hazardous situation with respect to doing what we'd like to do, which is to encourage uh, cross-fertilization and, and training in, in these two cultures because what you find when you look at the Department of Energy, they do science differently. They fund people differently. They train them differently. They work 
uh, in inherently as teams in a, in a way that's a little different from what happens through NIH. And getting that cross-cultural exchange is critical, but you know, we've got to fight for that department as well as for the NIH. So um, after the break, uh, it's really great that we've got Nicholas Bloomberg here from Elixir, which is uh, one of these data infrastructures in Europe. And you know, I think our experience there is that one has to have a different mentality in the infrastructure. Neither of you talked about infrastructure, interestingly, there, the kind, of, the kind of data infrastructure that this sits upon. But one of the aspects I notice about these other disciplines like oceanography, high energy physics, high energy is they have internalized their engineering, I think, a lot better than biology. They understand that they need those engineers. They understand that they need that infrastructure. They don't, they don't kind of stick it on afterwards, uh, you know, or, or try and make it mid-flight. So we often talk, I often talk about this. Uh, you know, I sometimes feel that we talk about it, but we don't change it. How can we change that appreciation of, uh, of, of infrastructure and standards, talking about a standard setting organization? Just one more kind of editorial point here. As we were talking last night, you said, well, people don't know about the Global Alliance, and that's probably true, but I don't know that many people know about the W3C Standards Consortium to the World Wide Web. They know the web works, they know their mobile phone works, they know someone makes all of that work, they don't really know, they assume that the right bits of standards and infrastructure work behind the you know, scenes. Standards, it's, it's a euphemistic word, sounds good. We ought to have standards, we ought to harmonize, we ought to collaborate, all the rest of it. I think one, one of the things you guys might do is uh, expand a little bit into the journalistic realm and think about how to make these problems more vivid. That is, what happens when we don't have standards? And what happens when we don't interoperate? Um, and I think you can make some messages, even based on real life yeah. situations, that, that clarify the, the, the need to do these things. You know, I work in a, at a <laughs> medical school affiliated with a hospital that exists on two campuses. It's a joint hospital. The systems do not interoperate. And you know, the, the near disasters almost every day are apparent, but, but uh, still hasn't been fixed. And this is a huge, huge problem. And I think one role that uh, the Global Alliance can play in, in, in the near future is to make apparent, not just in the health and genomics domain, but, but more generally, how important it is to have uh, ways to, to, make, to smooth the communications. So yeah, what do you I think th about this? Uh, I infrastructure and engineering. I process. totally agree that this has been underemphasized uh, in life science, and NIH is probably guilty of that as well. But boy, we are, we've woken up to it now. Uh, and, and a lot of this is driven simply by the scale of the enterprise that we now have the opportunity and the responsibility to pursue. The idea that you simply cannot expect to hand around uh, petabyte sized data sets from one place to the other or download it to your server to play with it because you wanted to. This is a sort of slow realization, I think, for much of the life science community that we are not going to be doing the most interesting science on our laptops, uh, that basically the data is going to be in the cloud and your analytics are going to have to go to the cloud if you're going to have the opportunity to do something really interesting. And that infrastructure is both a little scary to a lot of people who haven't done it, but it is an opportunity. Because if you are, as we are now doing uh, with uh, TopMed and GTEx and uh, a couple of other things, moving data into the cloud right now, this is the moment to be sure that the standards that are going to make it useful and interoperable are also inserted, not as an afterthought, but as part of this process. This is the moment, I think, where GA4, GH's uh, presence is going to be absolutely critical. And I do think you still don't quite have the visibility that would be ideal in order to make that happen. Well, this is why we're recruiting people like you to help make the noises to, on, to on do that. On the so-called senior or strategic advisory board? Strategic. <laughs> strategic. <laughs> And by the way, you, you just described the mandate of, uh, of uh, um, David Glazer and Brian O'Connor's uh, uh, cloud work stream pretty much perfectly there. Um, and I think uh, an exciting thing, again, just, just again, internationalizing this conversation, there are, the word cloud gets used in a variety of different ways. It, it can become synonymous to these large um, uh, uh, platforms as a service companies like Google, like Amazon like Microsoft, and it can also mean about virtualization, sometimes in an academic context, 
uh, on a countrywide basis, which is, is the more crudely, the more European way that's happening at the moment. And so, again, we, um, I'm conscious of the language that, 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 and the assumptions that happen as we talk about this. And the thing that I want to prevent is that we, we miss an opportunity for standardization because we haven't embraced you know, all of these uh, different ways of doing it. I mean, I mean, to be honest, there's just a lot more paranoia in, in some countries about these big American tech companies. And I think some of that paranoia is totally misplaced, but some of that paranoia has not necessarily grounding, but, but uh, is more thought through uh, in this. So um, I think we're closing up soon. And I just like, we have spent two days prioritizing our technical aspects of GA for GH. If you wanted to give us both one or two priorities, what, what would they be? Well, can I first ask you a question? What about genomic data that is not germline DNA or cancer DNA? Is GA4GH also positioning yourself uh, to manage uh, transcriptomes uh, from peripheral blood? Are you m organizing to manage uh, RNA from exosomes or even yes. free uh, RNA? Are, what about the microbiomes that are also going to be proliferating as part of healthcare? Single cell I mean, genomics. All good questions. So uh, we definitely, uh, and, and in the paper in BioArchive, you can read this, we, we use what I call the expansive definition of genomics. It means genome-wide assays. And you know, for the, for the people inside of the community, obviously we have a name for all of these different subcomponents, you know, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, microbiome, all these different things. And then the generic name sometimes is multiomics. You're having a conversation with a clinician, you're trying to get their head around what's going on. These words just get in the way. And I have found it consistently easier to, to wrap it all up in that word genomics. Um, so, so we, we take that expansive role of genomics and the things that you've just mentioned, Thomas Keane and Oliver Hoffman, it, that it's on their hopper in year ones and two uh, for things like the RNA-seq uh, there. So I think my recommendation would be to pay very close attention to that. You showed that breathtaking graph of the number of genomes that you expect the world is going to produce by 2022 and by 2030. But the amount of genomic data we have uh, over those timetables will not be that number multiplied by six uh, billion. It will be vastly greater than that. Because, because you do the germline once, or maybe you do the cancer a couple of times, but you might be doing the transcriptome and the exosome uh, and the free RNA um, on a you know monthly basis yeah. uh, for people at some high risk of developing an issue. So. The data that will probably dominate what GA4, GH is worried about 10 years from now may be much more of those omics uh, than the germline. Yep. I, I, it's a very good perspective. I think if I had one piece of evidence, uh, one piece of advice at this point, and I might have more later when we get on the phone <laughs> again, but, uh, but given the, the, the nature of your new plan, I think the most critical thing for, the, for, for this organization to do, well beyond the things we've talked about, like increasing our global participation, bringing in China and so forth, uh, is to make stronger connections with the clinical community. And you know, you're trying to do a very difficult thing. There are a lot of clinicians out there who don't know anything about the Global Alliance, but right now they're trying to figure out how to take electronic medical records and make them usable for continuous learning. And they're challenge, the, the, the ontology here, the, 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 the dictionaries, the, the, the vocabulary is very, very difficult. Um, it's hard to know what should be the standard pieces of data to go in. It's, you know, it's not like ACTG. Uh, it's, uh, you've got to decide, uh, does the age of the patient matter more than uh, the, the parental and grandparental histories? And uh, what symptoms and signs do you include in, the, in, in, in that repertoire of data? This is, these are really difficult questions, and the experience that genomicists have had in trying to aggregate data has been enormously successful. I know you're, you know, you're still wrestling with things, but, but the success of this enterprise in genomics needs to be brought to the attention of people who are wrestling with these parallel problems in the clinical domain. We all know 
that the genomic data is not going to be helpful in medicine unless there's clear correlation with not just diagnosis, but with outcomes and responses to therapy. And there's a lot of discoveries to be made here about uh, propensity to disease and metabolism of drugs. And, and uh, that those discoveries are only going to be made if there's a good medical record that people recognize can be exported from individual electronic medical records into a database. Well, you're absolutely right. And, and we're very lucky to have David Hansen and Melissa Handel uh, to run that work stream. It is not a small task. It is a big task. And uh, uh, the other aspect you mentioned there was this um, engagement with clinicians in a, in a kind of broad and deep way. Mm -hmm. And that's the task that Catherine has stepped up the plate to the plate too. Lucky Catherine. Um, uh, to do. So I'm glad we have identified both of your priorities, but I don't want to trivialize how hard it is to, yeah. to execute it. Absolutely. Identifying it is the easy thing, solving it is the hard thing. And then yeah, the then, out yeah. outreach to clinicians has been a pretty frustrating experience. We've tried multiple models over the last 20 years. It'd be worth looking at the history of the National Coalition for Health Professional Education and Genetics, NICHPEG, which is something that NIH started 20 years ago, worked really hard on, uh, had a very effective executive director and Joe McInerney reaching out to all the professional societies, going to AMA meetings, going to AAFP meetings, going to some of the specialty meetings and trying to sort of spread the gospel about why you need to know about genomics. And yet, that uptake uh, was very minimal because the practicing docs couldn't see for the most part, why do I need to know this? Everybody's always telling me something else I need to know about. I don't get it on this one, and I'm going to turn my attention to something that's going to change my practice today and not worry too much about tomorrow. That's all changed. 20 years along, we have a much better case to make, but it would still be useful to review sort of what worked and what didn't, mostly what didn't. Yeah. So Starting with oncologists, for example, as, as well as uh, pe pediatricians and people who do medical genetics, because these folks have seen the benefits yep. and they've learned how to incorporate genomics into their thinking about, about medicine. But even then, I, as I learned at a workshop run by the AACR last year, a highly respected national uh, oncology program uh, has only about 5 or 10 percent of its lung cancer patients subjected to genomic analysis, and that seems unbelievable at a time when we know that lung adenocarcinoma, the most common kind of lung cancer, frequently has mutations that, uh, that, um, that are addressable yeah. with, with drugs. Yeah. So those are, those are great pieces of advice. Uh, Catherine, I must put you in touch. Uh, uh, you have some homework uh, from this. Um, I think it just leaves uh, uh, me to say thank you very much, both uh, for this hour, but also for your continued support uh, for this organization. You were there from the beginning. From yeah, the beginning. And, and, um, and we'll be uh, there till the end. <laughs> we hope. The, the end is a long end, way away. The end of us will cook her first. <laughs> I'm quite sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so I hope that's been uh, an interesting uh, discussion. Um, and uh, we, I think, break for coffee now. So